God bless you, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this week's Godspeed Magazine Live. All of you that are reading now are looking all through the spiritual warfare issue, and you are seeing a particular story about being tormented by demons, the depth of which you'll be amazed as you read the article. But right now, we're going to bring you deeper. We're going to take you directly to the heart of the story with Michael Beckman, the CEO of Relentless Entertainment. This, this, this is the part that... Um that is challenging for some people to understand. But unless you walk in my shoes, I don't expect anybody to understand what I went through. I was eight years old. I was, uh, I was laying in my mom and dad's bed and I was looking at the wall and um, the atmosphere shifted. And I was, I was only years old. So I'm not using drugs and you know, wasn't drinking, nothing. I was eight years old. And uh, I was looking at the wall, and out came Satan. He came at me. He had a he had a, uh, a Hawaiian shirt on, a red Hawaiian shirt. He was walking super cocky, and he walked right up to me. He had a joint hanging on his mouth, and he took a big hit of the joint, and took his right hand and put it on my head, and he says, "I got you." And immediately, um, the very next day, my life changed. Eight years old, uh, pornography, pornography uh, I, just, I, just, I just stumbled across it. And at eight years old, it was a magazine. And um, uh, it, it, um, and it was even, it, it was even worse because uh, um, it was just very graphic. Like, I don't want to get into the detail, but uh, it, it, those things stayed in my head. And at eight years old, you're just not programmed to understand those kinds of things. And it got into my head, it got into my spirit, and eventually it, it stuck with me. It, the pornography was in my life. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna hide behind stuff. It, it, I got into bestiality. I got into promiscuity, um, and then on top of the drugs, it was. It was just like no holds barred. I just didn't care. It didn't. As long as I was uh, satisfying my flesh, I didn't care. Uh, I was. I. I. I, I ran a. Um, a fairly large uh, Lyman company, you know, climbing telephone poles, and that's just guys. Although all the crews were um, very, um, how would you say, intense. Um, they, oh, almost everybody on the crew was from some kind of gang, some kind of outlaw uh, affiliation, and and um, we we were just liming that we're crazy on telephone poles. We go up telephone poles, uh, burning telephone poles up in Hawaii, Altadena, Laguna, Malibu. Did all those fires, and, and they, they they took pride in, in being a little crazy. And so um, that's uh, we were on the Malibu fires. Uh, um, um, I'll never forget it. This is the day I met my brother, and. Um, I was I was the I was the top guy for the construction. I'm not trying to brag. I'm just being honest with you. I was the top guy at this construction company. I ran. I was the right hand man to the owner. And uh, my my brother now, my the, you know, I still call him my brother. Um, he uh, he was sitting in a um, in a big bucket truck and very quiet by himself. And uh, I opened up his door. And uh, you know, I was telling, giving him instruction, and he looks at me with a with a dead stare, and I, um, like like I'm gonna kill you. And um, I step back, and when I step back, I could see underneath the seat, and um, there was a big 45 gun with a barrel on it. it was no joke, it was about that big. It was underneath the thing, and he looks at me, and he says. Um, I said, hey man, what, what's that gun for? And he says, it's you, it's for you if you don't get out of my face. 
And that was my introduction um, to the biker scene. And um, something in me wanted to get close to this man. One of the things that uh, we would do is, um, you know, if, if I was with my brothers, because I was still, um, I was a hang around, which is not exactly in, but you get to hang around them. And then I was a prospect. And um, when they tell you to do something, you do it. And um, we were sitting at a table once and uh, someone pissed off one of my brothers. And uh, my brother looked at me. He goes like that, it was the green light. And um, I look back on it and that guy didn't deserve that. You know what I'm saying? He, um, I, re I remember a lot of blood down the stairwell. Um, he had a family and um, yeah, he didn't deserve what I did to him. One night, um, we were up in Santa Rosa. Uh, it was a dark, rainy night. And um, I, I, I couldn't find anybody. And then someone came down and got me because I had a big office. Someone that came down to my office and says, um, they want you upstairs. I'm like, who? Um, your brother, your brother wants you upstairs. I'm like, okay. So uh, as I'm walking up the stairs, I kind of feel like, like something's not right. And um, I noticed that no one's around. And when I went upstairs and opened the door, all of the officers of the club were standing up there, including my brother. And um, and I walk in um, and I'm standing there. And um, the, the man, uh, probably one of the very few moments where I really felt scared, like, like something's gonna happen. And they're all standing there looking, they're big guys, man, they're big. And there's like, there was five of them. And um, they just looked at me and um, they were, I thought we we're gonna get into a tangle. I thought I was gonna get jumped. And they ended up laughing at me and they slapped me on the back and they said, you're in. I, my, my, my biggest regret is just hurting people. Is um, even leading people down a road of addiction. Those are, you know, those are things that I, that I did. That, uh, that, that, um, um, I hurt, I hurt my son by being addicted. I lost him. He didn't deserve that. I, I was violent with my family. They didn't deserve that. I was violent to people. That didn't, they didn't deserve that. Just because I was high and wanted to prove a point. I, yeah, there, there are things that happen. And yeah, there are things I don't want to talk about. But that's where like, I, I can't like even let my mind like entertain those thoughts because the enemy wants to still pull me down. He still wants to tell me that you're not forgiven, that there is no power in the cross. Well, I remember, I remember the first time I ever took meth. And what led me to that point is that the curiosity, it was just curiosity. And um, we were just, I was just hanging out. Actually, um, he was my best friend at that time. And he asked me if I wanted to smoke, smoke meth, and I went ahead and did it. And you know, some people call it the one-hit drug. I took one hit, and that was it. I was, I was hooked. But looking, looking back on uh, everything, I, I just feel like um, the real source of of this all was demonic forces. Uh, experience those from a very early age. You know, um, you know, some, I think half, 
half of the problem or half of the issue within the church is that they don't want to acknowledge that there is a devil. And, um, and uh, you know, I know that there's a devil. I had an encounter with him when I was eight years old. I know there are demons. I encountered these things, these entities and, and spirits my whole life. Like just to just to talk about that just brings me back to a time where I already I always I already feel emotion. Um, some of my darkest days are one of my darkest darkest times is uh, is being um, in the middle of a street uh, high and not wanting to be high no more and severely um, addicted to meth amphetamine and with all my heart I wanted to get off of it I couldn't I couldn't stand up I couldn't understand um, what was going on around me all I could do is just cry and I was screaming at the top of my lungs it was probably like it felt like it was like 110 degrees outside and sweating profusely and just screaming out to God and asking and even the neighbors were coming out and and looking at me but no one would approach me to help me no no one would ask me if you wanted water or how can i help and um it was so uh it was so eye-opening and in that moment i felt like god was saying to me he finally he spoke it felt like he spoke through all that, that his, his voice was so strong. Despite all the things, the paranoia, the demons and everything, that his voice came down and said to me, no one's going to help you but me. And um, I stood up and, and I was still crying, but, but I, I had the, the will to stand up. I actually... Uh, quit everything I was doing. I quit work and I tried to focus on just getting clean and it wasn't happening. And I've come to find out later on in, in life and I, I have no regrets about this or no animosity, but someone in my family kind of ratted me out. And um, uh, when I went to take my son back to his mom, um, the cops um, raided me and they pulled me away from my son. And to, to see the horror in my son's eyes of his daddy being pulled away from me, obviously it still hurts me today. I love my son. So, um, when they ripped him out of my, my arms, he was screaming, Daddy, don't go, don't go. And, um, you no, know, what could I do? Okay, so I lost my son. They, they dragged me away from my boy. And I, I went from, from thinking I was the baddest dude on earth. I know I wasn't, but in my head, uh, I thought I was the baddest dude on earth. Uh, and running with all these people and having lots of money and and thought I was somebody. In a moment, I realized I was nothing when they took my boy from me. You realize that, that you're, you're not very big. So you understand that how big God is and the things around you, how, how just vast he is. And um, so I, uh, I had to um, take a, I took about a week and I went to bed and I just slept. I slept and I slept and I slept. And I slept for about a week. And when I, when I got up, um, uh, I called my grandfather. Which he's dead now, but um, I called him and he, he was like this old gangster who, who, who even knew Nicky Cruz and, and um, uh, um, was, uh, ran drugs and got radically saved. And 
I called him and I said, I said, Grandpa, I don't want to run no more. I said, I want to come home. And he said, he said Mijo, he never left you. He never left you, Mijo. And something that really shook me, that really, really like made me understand is that um, he said, Mijo, he was there all the time. And I said, what? He saw everything I did. And like, it's almost like I got embarrassed. And he, he said, he was there the whole time. And he said, Mijo, did you know he engraved your name in his hand? And I'm like, here I am being a man's, a man's man. And he says, yeah, he, he engraved your name in his hands. And I was like, that is cool. That is cool. That is cool that Jesus loved me so much that he decided to engrave my name in his hand. To engrave anything into, into the flesh has got to be painful. But he, he, he loved me so much. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the power of the cross. And um, he said, yeah, Mijo, he engraved your name. I said, let's do this. So we prayed together and um, I, uh, um, I accepted uh, Jesus back in my heart, told him he was the king of my life. And, and uh, um, that I was gonna pursue him. Uh, the great thing about that is that you have to catch him before you can clean him. And and um, I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna sit and lie just because I'm in an interview. I'm gonna be honest with you guys is that it was a process. It was a long process for me to get off of drugs. Um, a really uh, a true, true deliverance didn't happen until I actually I met my wife. And um, uh, I just, God told me that he was gonna send me my wife to, to help me get over these things. And, and, um, and, you know, God just surrounded me with people that have, that have, um, have uplifted me, not brought me down. And I kind of, I finally, when I come to the end of, of running with the outlaws, I understood that I had a calling on my life, that God, God before the foundations of the earth has already ordained me, not by man, that God ordained me himself to be a witness for his glory. And so like, I just wanna say like, no matter how much darkness you've been in, that God is a mighty God. He can reach down and grab you and pull, pull you out of that. And he can redeem you from all uh, iniquities, from all sin. And he can, and he can re, he can touch your life and totally redeem you. I can't wait for the next semic, bro. And I can talk about all the good stuff that we're doing now, but um, I just want to want to let you know that that uh, that addiction can't be held, uh, not even murder or or all the things that that society deems you as an outcast. It can't hold you when you got Jesus in your life. I know, I know, buddies that have done murders in prison, they come out. And they're amazing men. I don't care what society says. That once Jesus gets a hold of you, you become a different man. After seeing that testimony, I want you to know there's more. There's a future chapter. There's a hope. And when we return from this commercial, you're gonna see that interview and that hope with Michael Beckman. God bless you, brothers and sisters. We are honored now to bring you Michael Beckman, CEO of Relentless Entertainment. Michael, what's up, Jerry? Thank you for being here. With Thanks, us, man, for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. I, you know, it's amazing that you've gone from just from the from biker gangs, from yeah. from the harshest demonic attacks, decades yeah. of demonic attacks, from from unspeakable brutal stuff just everywhere, all the way to redeemed. And my thought is, 
how, what was that? How did you come through the redemption process? And what do you think God called you into? Like, what was the mission he had for you as he was redeeming you? What do you want you to do? That's a, that's a great question. And I want to be super real um, about, about that question. And um, I don't want to be uh, uh, in any way, shape or form false about my whole situation. And um, uh, one of the things, well, you and I have been friends for, for a while now. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, let's be real, bro. Yeah. You know you've seen me struggle, brother. You have seen it fa- straight up. You know, if the enemy barking in my face, bro. Yeah. And uh, and even at that time, which which I want to just say to, to see the people up there, it's because of brothers like this. Not with not with um not with malice, not with judgment, but with the love of Christ in their hearts, are we able to stand together? Amen. And so so you know, I, I meth meth methamphetamine pornography was was like engaged in my life even though i loved jesus it, it was something i had to sift through right and so like i i for some people it's a miraculous equation that instantly happens right right just being real mm-hmm. for me there was a part of me that didn't want to let go bro there it was a will thing and after after seeing how much of everything that i have lost the relationships of, that i lost you, there's a comes a point in your life that you got to stand mm, and say, come on. I'm, I'm not taking this no more. That's right. God's got a better way for me. God's got a higher calling for me. Yes. And that's when, because of relationships like you, bro, standing with me, not condemning me, but loving me through the process, not, mm. not, not tolerating the sin, but loving the man behind it. You know what yes, I'm saying? Absolutely. And so like in, in, in addressing, um, you know, having talked with me and, and loving me through the process, Never once that ever felt condemned by you. And the people that are still in my life that know that 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 helped me through those situations, it was a process. I had to be loved. We're so quick to judge each other. Mm-hmm. And, I'm, and, and the last time I read the scriptures, the last time I read the Bible, it says it's the goodness of God that causes us to repent, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, like it, through that process, through the love of of the loved ones around me, I can't I was able. To, to overcome, got married, bro, got a beautiful wife, she rocks, she supports me, I got homies around me that, that are lifting me up, and in, 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 in believing in the, in the things that we're doing, we're partnered yeah. with you guys on a few yes. pro- projects, Praise I mean, God. that's that's the process, is, is the love of God, Amen. that's it. Amen. Yeah. That is awesome. So as you, and for what it's worth too, for, yeah. for anybody that, that forgets, we have to refer back to the authority on everything that has to do with God. And Jesus is the only, only authority, not us, not, not PhDs, not, I love my pastor. I love all the scholarly people, but the authority is Jesus. And Jesus is specifically asked by his own disciple. Well, how many times should I forgive him them? Like five, six, seven, he's trying to get a number. We're going to, we cut this guy off right right here. And Jesus is talking about seven times 70. I mean, we are talking about massive amounts, you know, forgiveness. Yeah. So according to the authority, we keep forgiving. We keep on working with each other. We keep moving through stuff together and we stay in unity as the strength is what, and that's what God is building on us right now. And so why do you think, what do you think God's mission was for you as he brought you through? Like, did you sense right away that God wanted you to do something with Relentless? Or was there a was there a particular thing you felt called into mission-wise? You know what, bro? I remember um um when when I got when I lost my son and to the government and it was from my reckless lifestyle. And in that in that moment, I knew that I wasn't the biggest, baddest biker that I thought I was. At a moment. God humbled me, and I, and I remember saying, "Lord, Lord, if this is you, I'm not asking you." I moved like Elijah, bro, like a, like Elijah when the mantle was grabbed from Elijah from uh, Elijah to Elijah when it was passed. Mm-hmm. Elijah didn't wait for a miracle. He didn't wait for a blind man. He didn't wait for a sick person to come by. He grabs the mantle from Elijah, strikes the ground, and said, "Where's the God of Elijah?" pushing on God to move on his behalf. And that's what I did when I got, when I, when, when, when I knew when, when my son was taken from me, that was the breaking yeah, point that in my life. Yeah, you cry out. Yeah, it made me cry out. I, I was no longer that big bag and thought, thought I was all that. In a moment, I was humbled and I said, Lord, 
If you're going to allow this to happen, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you to use me to win millions for your glory. And no matter how far you're, you're, you're deep into, into darkness, is that um, God could pull you out, just like yeah. he pulled me out. And, and guys, if, if, if you're not familiar with the process of salvation, it's just so important to know repentance is not making somebody shamed or feel bad. Exactly. Repentance is helping someone change and let go of all the garbage they're carrying, all the sin, all the unforgiveness in most cases, because it's what unlocks this process where revival starts to happen and the Holy Spirit drops in in radical miracles. And we've seen this so, he and I have both seen this so close and yeah. personal. And then this restoration piece comes. Absolutely. So you just see this huge and so it's really important that yeah. we're out there helping people get to repentance through kindness. You know, when I think one of the things that that, that um, I see that um, that the enemy likes to do, and that's place shame mm -hmm. on people. Oh, completely right. Completely, like even people. You're not within, good enough. Yeah, nobody even, wants you. Even if you're saved, nobody loves you. Even if you're saved, especially like if you're walking with Christ. And the, there's something that, that hasn't been addressed. Man, the enemy likes to come in there and just cover you with shame. Let me tell you something. Because of the cross, because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are not designed to carry shame. That's right. We, we're not. It's, it's, it's not in our DNA. Yep. It's not for us to carry. Yep. If, if, if we don't have a revelation of what Jesus did on the cross, then he did it in vain. Right? Like, he took that's that's why I can talk about the, the you know I, I talked in, in the deepness of, of the levels of pornography I got I'm not ashamed to talk about it because I've been covered by the blood because of what Jesus did on the cross that's the miracle of salvation yeah. we're a walking miracle yes literally yes and the thing is if you're wondering in the process if any of you are feeling like the thing that always happens is we have sort of the before and after and we only sort of see it in black and white but if you're in the shades of gray meaning that you're saved and you find yourself struggling with whatever that shade of gray is yeah. you haven't dealt with i just want to let you know that when jesus moves into you whether you're aware of it or not you can't have sin in you with you on you you cannot mm -hmm. because before you could have sin all over you and just take give me more and it feels good but the moment jesus lives in you yeah. it's like all of a sudden everything that sin stinks with the kind of stench that something in you is going, I'm just not comfortable with this. And you're trying to act like you are, trying to act like you used to be, That's but right. you're not. Come you on. can't be. Once Jesus moves into you, every single sin that you try to still commit is, is going to cause a burning. It's going to cause a, a conviction. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit's going to move in and move you. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to, again, let it go. Repent the thing. Yeah. Let it out. Be honest. Be humble. Be broken. Let people know about it. Come transparent. Just let it go. Sooner, not later. Don't yeah. let it become a big scandal. Yeah. Let it be like as soon as you can. Today is the right day Absolutely. to call whoever it is in your life and say, I'm sorry. Even if in some cases it wasn't even your fault. Even if in some cases it was completely their fault. It's actually the greatest thing you can ever do to go, you know what? I'll just take all the blame for that. Yeah. Let's yeah. let this go, you know. And yeah. so, brothers and sisters, thank you for being with us. Again, thank you, Michael. Yeah, buddy. And God bless you. And if you bring the full gospel of Jesus Christ, Godspeed. Speed.